And now if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we'll prepare our hearts to receive from God's word. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 through 5 from the NIV. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. This is God's word. Thanks, Sterling. Also, thank you for interpreting your Aramaic so that we could be edified. Good morning, everyone. My name's Dominic. If, why did only seven of you guys respond to my greeting just now? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominic. If we haven't met, I'm one of the pastor elders here. Uh, stay open to 1 Corinthians 14. Okay, if you have your Bible or Bible app, stay open to 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to be referencing that a lot today. I also just want to say thank you to the, uh, the worship team for leading us today. If you noticed, we had a, a, a different guy on stage. That was Aaron Cronin from Reality Carp. So thankful that he's here with us today. Also happens to be my brother-in-law, which is fun. Um, on Sundays, we have been recently learning about the spiritual gifts and how every member plays an important role in the body. It's vital for every member to play their role in every season, right? But especially in this season, you guys, because if you don't know, we are in a, a fun season. We are, we are moving buildings in uh, several months from now. And with that, we are integrating over 100 new people into the life of reality. This month, we're having a series of what we're calling integration meetings with the congregation over there. And then on June 2nd, just in two weeks, they're going to come here and they're going to start joining us at our Goodyear property while we're renovating over there at Ralston. And then in the fall sometime, we will move back there together. They are going to integrate beautifully into the life of reality. Beautiful people. They're amazing. I've got to spend time with many of them. And there's going to be a lot of moving parts, right? And so as we're praying and as we're preparing, we want to just remember the importance of each one of us operating in our gifts for the edification of the body. Amen? Let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for every gift that you have given us. I pray even now, God, that I would operate in the gift of teaching and exhortation, that you would speak even prophetically to your people. We ask that our hearts would be open to hear what your spirit has to say for us. Lord, we want everything that you have for us, nothing more, nothing less. And with such a touchy subject this morning, I, uh, I ask that you would minister to us in the way that only you can. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was 13 years old, and I got invited to this Christian summer camp. I'd been to several, several camps. I was like, I got this. But I had never been to a Foursquare summer camp. <laughs> I love my Foursquare brothers and sisters, but this camp was a little crazy. So it's the second night. And they do this like afterglow time after the service or whatever. And I was like, this is cool, man. I've done like afterglows. We're going to worship and whatever. But this wasn't like a normal afterglow. The guy gets up and he's like, hey, I'm going to pray for everybody now that you'd receive whatever gifts the Lord has for you. I'm like, cool. Gifts of the Spirit. All right. I heard about this. My dad's a pastor. So he's praying for people. And then he's like, now I want to pray that you would receive the gift of tongues. And I was like, all right, tongues. And so uh, he starts praying. All of a sudden, there's like hundreds of kids just speaking in tongues around me. Me and my cousin look at each other and we're like, dude, what's going on? And he says, if you haven't got the gift of tongues yet, you might need a little phrase to help you get started. So just start saying, shamana, 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 shamana. So my cousin and I look at each other, shamana, 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 shamana. The gift never came. Several years later, it did. Today, we are talking about the gift of tongues. And we're going to take an entire Sunday 
to do it, not because the Bible puts a big emphasis on it, it actually does just the opposite, but because there's no other gift that is more overemphasized, despised, ostracized, obsessed about, mysterious, misused, abused, or misunderstood than the gift of tongues. Also, it's weird. It's a trippy, strange gift. And so it needs some explanation. Now, in a group this size, I am aware that as soon as I said the phrase like gift of tongues, that some of you were like, oh, dude, I, this is weird. I don't know. I don't want to talk about tongues. Others of you have legitimate like, like a trauma experience and reaction in you right now because of just like past abuse of the gift and misuse and trauma around the subject. And then some of you guys, are, you're maybe visiting or you're a new believer or you're just here exploring Christianity, exploring Jesus. And you're like, wait, what? Tongues? Like the thing in our mat? Like, what are you talking about, dude? I know it's a weird phrase. I promise you it's going to get even weirder. <laughs> but it should make sense by the end. Paul was writing to a church in Corinth that was totally messing up the use of this gift in their public gatherings. So he had to write an entire chapter to bring order to the chaos and to bring clarity to the mystery. Most of us are probably in a different camp. Many of us today are just like, dude, I don't even know about it. Like, I'm, maybe I'll just stay away from it. Or like, I had a bad experience. I don't want to have anything to do with that. So I want to clarify some things today by first answering the question, what is the gift of tongues? Here's a simple working definition for us. It is the spirit of a person enabled by the Holy Spirit to worship or pray to God in a way that is apart from the mind of the person and in a language that is not known by the person. After Jesus rose from the dead, but before he ascended to the Father, he told his disciples, go to Jerusalem and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so they're there in Acts chapter two and says this, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these all who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native tongues? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from both uh, from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, so people from every single direction as far as you could go. We hear them, they said, declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Before we answer the question, what does this mean? Here's what we need to know for now. 120 people Holy Spirit comes upon them. What happens? They immediately start speaking in tongues. Now, let's look at Acts chapter 10. You don't have to go there. Just, I'm gonna put it up on the screen. Acts chapter 10. Peter's about to preach the gospel to the, who will be the first ever Gentile, that is non-Jewish Christians. He's preaching in Acts 10. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, that's the, the Bible's funny way of saying Jewish Christians, who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. How did he know this? For, or how did they know this? For they all heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So these people are saved. These Gentiles, spirit comes upon them. What happens? They begin speaking in tongues. One more from Acts chapter 19. This is 20 years later, okay? The gospel is still being preached throughout uh, all the Roman Empire. Acts 19. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, what baptism did you receive? 
John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism to repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So these people had heard about Jesus. They had repented. They had turned from their sin, but they had not yet put their trust in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So now these people are saved, they are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin to speak in tongues. Okay, cool. So what is the gift of tongues? The first thing we need to know is this. A language unknown to the speaker. It is a language unknown to the speaker. It can be an earthly language or a heavenly language. Acts chapter 2 is an example of actual earthly languages unknown to people speak... uh, unknown to the people speaking these languages, but understood by those who are fluent in these languages. How cool is this gift, right? You're traveling somewhere else, you're in another country, and you're like, gosh, I wish I could just like speak something that they could understand in their own native tongue. And then God gives you this gift, you're able to to do it, and they understand what you're saying. They're extremely edified because of this. That's what's happening here with the earthly language. But Acts 10 and 19 are assumed to be something different a mysterious, non-earthly language that many scholars refer to as a heavenly language that only God can understand. You should have your Bibles open in 1 Corinthians 14. Check out verse two. For the person who speaks in another tongue is not speaking to people, but to God, since no one understands him. So this here is a language that people cannot understand. He speaks mysteries in the spirit, it says. The heavenly tongue is a language that no one understands except God. So tongues is the speaking of a language unknown to the speaker, and it can be a earthly language or a heavenly language. And it is a sign, not the, but it is a sign of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit came upon the people in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, they all began to speak in tongues. But there are 22 accounts of people being saved in the book of Acts and only three mentions of people speaking in tongues. We just read all three. And this is one of the most misunderstood things about the gift of tongues. There are even some Christians who are our brothers and sisters, love them, Christians who believe that if you do not speak in tongues, then you don't have the Holy Spirit or that you're just not saved at all. We would reject that. It's just not true. Paul's really clear in 1 Corinthians 12, 30. He says, not all prophesy. Speaking about Christians, he's like, not all prophesy. Not all speak in tongues. Tongues is a sign, but not the sign of the Holy Spirit. And tongues is also always directed to God and not to people. Verse two, It says, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. We talked about prophecy last week and words of knowledge. Those things are always spoken to uh, the believers, right? They're spoken to one another. Tongues is not this way. Things like teaching, exhortation, those are spoken to one another. Tongues is not this way. It's always directed toward God. And unlike some of the gifts we looked at last week, once you have it, you have it. Things like healing and words of knowledge, talked about it last week. Sometimes they come often, usually, most of the time, they come in just for a particular situation. Tongues doesn't seem to be that way. There's nothing in scripture that implies like you get it for a moment or a situation and then you don't. Once you have it, you have it. I'm not saying God can't do that. Gives you just the gift for a moment or a few minutes or whatever. But in general, once you have it, you have it. Now, the gift of interpretation seems to work both ways. I, I know people who... They just got the inter- gift of interpretation one time in like a prayer meeting or whatever. And other people who are like, yeah, I have interpretation all the time. Whenever somebody speaks in tongues, I get the interpretation. Next, you need to know that it is downplayed for corporate use. It's downplayed for corporate use, which is probably why many of us are like, yeah, dude, I've never even heard tongues. I don't have it. I've never heard it in a public gathering. That's probably right because it's actually downplayed for public use. When Paul lists the gifts of the Spirit by priority, he actually puts tongues and the interpretation of tongues last, two different times when he lists uh, the gifts by priority. Though it is sometimes the most obsessed about gift, it's actually the least emphasized 
specifically as it pertains to using gifts in like a public corporate setting. Remember the context that Paul is writing to here is a a church. He's writing to an entire church. He's addressing like, it'd be like reality Ventura. He's talking to all of us. He's like at your public gatherings. That's what he's doing in Corinth. He's like the church in Corinth at your public gatherings. And then fill in the blank. He goes to give all of this instruction. But if Paul downplays the gift for corporate use and, and tells us that we should actually desire other things like prophecy, for instance, way more, then do we even need it? Yes. Why? Why do we need the gift of tongues? First, because it benefits the body. It benefits the body. If interpreted. Without an interpretation, tongues is not edifying to other people when used in a public manner. But Paul says at the end of verse 5, If there is an interpretation, then it is actually very edifying. The couple of times that I've seen this happen, it was beautiful. I was like, yeah, dude, that was rad. It wasn't like more edifying than other gifts, but it was great. It was edifying. When the people spoke in Acts chapter 2, it was very edifying to the people who were listening and were able to interpret because it was their own language. By the way, wouldn't it have been a bummer if Sterling spoke that thing in Aramaic and all of a sudden didn't give an interpretation, just walked off the stage? You'd be like, that sounded pretty, but I'm not edified. But then he gave the interpretation. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm edified, right? So it actually benefits the body if interpreted. But it is especially beneficial for the individual. Verse four says, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. Again, without an interpretation, tongues is is not edifying to other people when used in a public manner. But if tongues is used in a private manner, even without an interpretation, It is very edifying to the person speaking. Here's the deal, guys. I want to take a couple minutes on this because this really frames the entire like subject of tongues. And it's very important that we hear this. We make a way bigger deal about the gift of tongues as a corporate gift than the Bible does. Paul spends an entire chapter here explaining or talking about it, not because he's emphasizing it. He doesn't emphasize it. He actually downplays it. But because they had messed it up so bad, he had to give instruction to clean it up. But he does not prioritize it for corporate use. Case in point, Paul is clear that he himself speaks in tongues, but most scholars actually believe that he rarely, if ever, did it in public, which makes sense why he would say in verse 19... But in the church, so he's contrasting, right? He's like, at home, that's one thing. That's a different story. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words. Jesus loves you so much. Five, done. You're like, please, can you just do that, Tom? Stop talking in five words. He's like, I'd rather just speak five intelligible words than 10,000 words in a tongue. This, this, phrase translated 10,000 actually doesn't mean 10,000. It means the highest numeric value and incalculable number. So he, he, he would rather say, Jesus loves you so much than a gazillion words in tongues. So most scholars believe that he never actually spoke in tongues with the Corinthian church. And because of this, they were like, dude, this guy doesn't speak in tongues which is why I love in verse 18, he's like, I speak in tongues. I speak in tongues more than any of you guys. Okay, in case you're wondering, I speak in tongues more than everybody. But he's like, I just don't do it around you because when I'm around you, I'd rather do something that I know is gonna be edifying to you. So I'm gonna prophesy, I'm gonna teach, I'm gonna exhort. But for personal use, look what Paul says, verse 14. For I pray in tongues, For wi- I'm sorry, if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. So what shall I do? He's like, I can't even understand what I'm saying. So is it pointless then? No, I will pray with my spirit, that is tongues, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. He's saying, not only is tongues not unbeneficial, but tongues is also so beneficial that I do it even though I have no clue what I'm saying. And I can attest to this in my own life. For me, I speak in tongues regularly, but I rarely, if ever, have the the sense to do it in a public corporate setting. But in my own 
personal prayer life, there are few things that have been as beneficial to me personally than the gift of tongues. Tongues is downplayed in the Bible as a corporate gift, but it is almost, I'm, honestly, it is almost irreplaceable, at least for me as a personal gift. So what specifically is so beneficial about it? Well, first of all, it's a tool for intercession, a powerful tool for intercession. Remember, tongues is always directed toward God, right? That means it's either going to be a prayer, a praise, or it's going to be thanksgiving. First, it's going to be prayer. It's a tool for intercession. Many scholars actually believe that this is what's happening in Romans 8 when, um, when Paul is talking about uh, this, this, these wordless groans. I'll read it for us now. Romans 8, verse 26, it says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. The Holy Spirit searches our hearts and helps us in our weakness pray to the Father. And many believe that these wordless groans here are a heavenly prayer language that the Spirit uses to do this, to intercede for us. Either way, the point's the same. The Spirit is interceding through us when we don't know how. That means that, that he may be asking the Father to do something for you that you didn't even realize you needed. He may be asking the Father to do something about your situation that you couldn't have even comprehended. This may not be a regular occurrence for all of you guys, but for me in my own prayer life and just personal life, I am often at a loss for how to pray for a situation, especially and specifically if I'm, it's, it's overwhelming or the situation, or I'm overwhelmed or it's confusing. It's just a lot of like, like, gosh, dude, I can't, like, what is happening here? Or if I'm just discouraged and like tired and worn out from the season or for, from the situation. I don't have unlimited knowledge. I don't have unlimited wisdom or understanding or unlimited perspective to see the situation in all of the different ways. But the Spirit does. Sometimes I've also just prayed everything that I know how to pray. And it's like, gosh, I just keep repeating myself, but I feel like I need to keep praying for this. Like I have more to say. I've run out of words or I've used all the words that I know. It's in these moments as the Spirit searches my heart that he enables my spirit to pray exactly what I needed to pray, even though I don't know what I'm saying. But it's not just a tool for intercession. Tongues is also a tool for worship. Remember, it is to God. So what do we speak to God? Well, we're either praying or we're praising. There are times when you are so overwhelmed with worship toward God. You're like, full of so much gratitude. You're like, gosh, I wish I could just tell you. Or you're just full of awe and wonder and reverence. Or you're just full of adoration and love. And you're like, I've used all my words or I don't have the right words. I wish I could say more to you. What a beautiful gift from God that out of the overflow of the heart, the spirit can move in us to speak forth worship to the Father. It's powerful. It's a gift from the Lord. Someone asked me this week what my, ex my personal experience is like um, when I speak in tongues. For me, here's the phrase I came up with. It feels like a secret relief. Like, you know when you have to say something to someone and you're like, gosh, I gotta talk to this person about this thing. Maybe it's a, a good thing. Maybe it's a hard thing. And then you finally do it and you're like, oh, I'm so relieved that I finally got that out. That's what it feels like, except multiplied by several. The spirit searches your heart and then supernaturally enables your spirit to say things that need to be said. And somehow, miraculously, though you don't even know what you're saying, it's like you just said everything that you need to say. But it's a secret. It's like this mysterious thing. It's like between you and the, it feels like spiritual Morse code or something. Like the Lord, the Father, and the Spirit communing together through, but I'm involved somehow, I'm benefiting, but I don't know what's going on, I don't know what's being said. It's like 
God gave us a language to pray in that is secret and yet somehow relieves our souls. Guys, it is beautiful and it is powerful. Yeah, it's strange. But what a gift from the Father to his children. All right, Dom, I get it. I see the value of it. Maybe I'm even down, but how does this whole thing play out? How does the gift of tongues function? First, let me just talk about how it, how it works. How does it work? Like mechanically, how does this like happen? First of all, tongues is enabled by the Holy Spirit. Contrary to what the guy at the summer camp implied, you can't just like make it happen. You can't just like make it happen. And it doesn't happen for everyone. Not everyone gets the gift of tongues. First Corinthians 1230 again, not all prophesy, not all get tongues. Maybe all don't need it. Maybe I have a bad vocabulary and I need extra words, right? Maybe not all need it. All don't get it. But when it does happen, it's going to be by the spirit. Acts two says that people began to speak in tongues as the spirit enabled them. So tongues is enabled by the Holy Spirit, but it is also subject to the speaker. With all of the, the spiritual gifts, there is both a supernatural and a natural element to them. They really are God working in you supernaturally, and you really will experience his presence and his power as you use the gifts. And there's some mystery there, right? There's some like mystery there, there's some unknown. It's like I'm speaking this thing to God and my heart needs to say it, but I don't know what I'm saying, but the spirit understands and the father understands. It's, it's good, right? There's something mysteriously supernatural about that. But there was also this very natural element. It's happening in like in you, in your body, with your mouth and your voice. This also means that it is then under your control. Verse 32 says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. The mouths of the speakers are subject to the speakers. It's a voluntary thing. You're not a robot that, that God has spoken through. You're not like possessed by him. You're not gonna be with a coworker and then all of a sudden just shamana, 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 shamana. I'm sorry, dude, I can't stop it. Shamana, shamana, shamana. That's not how this works. It is not involuntary. And don't let anybody tell you, dude, I'm sorry, man. It just like came out. I had to speak it super loud. It was the spirit. No, 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 no. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Even if you are moved to speak in tongues at a certain moment, but it's not the right moment, you don't have to speak. Let me give you just a personal example. There are times when I'm leading worship and I'm in a corporate setting like this, and I am moved to sing or pray something that was unplanned. And sometimes I have words for it. You'll hear me, I'll, I'll sing something, or maybe I'm humming just like, you know, a, a melody or something. There are other times when I, I am so moved that I, if I was by myself, I would speak or sing in tongues. But I choose not to, even though I may want to, I choose to hold it back. Why? because it would not be edifying to anybody. It'd just be weird. You guys would be like, what the heck? What? I'm out. Do you like, what's going on right now? This is weird. And so I choose not to do it because it would not be helpful. It's not the time and it's not the place. So it's enabled by the spirit, but subject to the speaker. And in order to receive the gift, you don't have to force it. The dude at my summer camp was wrong. You don't need a phrase to get it revved up and just get it rolling. And then it starts working. Here, let me, let me just like remove some of the mystery for some of us. It's just how it happened in like my own personal life and my wife's life. Got saved when I was 16 years old. Heard about the gifts of the spirit. I was like, dude, that's amazing. God gives us gifts. Are you kidding me? Heard about the gift of tongues. And I was like, hey, honestly, dude, that just sounds so cool that I get to speak to God in a different language. So I started asking immediately for the gift of tongues. I didn't get it right away. A few days later, I'm praying again and I'm praying under my breath uh, in English and as I'm asking for the gift, all of a sudden my English words just turn into some other language. And I'm like thinking, my head is like, doesn't know what I'm saying, but I can hear myself speaking at something else. Then I had the gift. Now I have the gift. I can use it if I want to. For my wife, 
She didn't even ask. She got saved a couple months later. She's worshiping with some of her friends and they're just asking God for more of himself. And as she's singing, worshiping, she just begins to sing in another tongue. Now she's got it if she wants to use it. For some, it's right at the moment of salvation. For some, it's years later. For some, it's never at all. In any case, it doesn't need to be forced. There is no striving for anything of the Spirit, including his gifts. Once you have it, it works just like normal language. You hear a sound in your head and you decide to verbalize it, or you just choose to do it. You know, if you're, if you're bilingual or know somebody who's bilingual, it, it would be similar to this. I, I imagine I'm not bilingual, but it would be similar to this where you just choose, all right, I'm going to speak in Portuguese now and I'm going to choose to do it under my breath or I'm going to choose to do it out loud. It's very much like normal language. So when it happens though, you can be then moved to speak or you can just choose to speak. So there are times when you will be overwhelmed with a burden to intercede or worship so much so that you will feel compelled to speak in tongues. And when that happens, you can, if the context is right, you can just let it out. It almost feels like, like the Holy Spirit is like, hey, I know you have no more words. Let me just take this for you. Let me do this for you. Let me pray to the Father or worship the Father on your behalf because you're out of words or you're out of strength or whatever. And you're compelled, you're moved. But then there are other times when it's more of a, like a deliberate choice. You consciously recognize your need for something beyond yourself. You know that you are unable to pray and worship with your own words, or maybe you're just out of words. And so you choose to do it. You want to do it because you know that it's good. Now, if it's just you and the Lord, dude, go for it. You do you, boo. But if you are in a public corporate gathering, there are some parameters, which is why Paul was writing to the Corinthian church in the first place. And this, this is where it gets messy for people. This is where it can, there can be a lot of abuse. People who have baggage, it is because of the wrong unbiblical public use of this gift. So let me take a few minutes here to talk about this. In a public church gathering where anybody can be, it's open to the public, how should it be practiced? First, honestly, infrequently. Paul doesn't forbid speaking in tongues in the public church gathering, but he does minimize it. Why? Number one, Edification for believers and evangelization to non-believers requires intelligible content. And tongues by itself can't provide that. And two, if unbelievers are present, which is very possible and very likely in a public church service, when someone speaks in tongues, the, the unbeliever, it says in verse 16, will feel alienated, and this is my addition, they're also gonna just think you're crazy. Tongues is strange, and so it requires a lot of explanation. On the other hand, if a non-believer comes to a gathering and hears something like teaching or even, honestly, like a, a prophetic word or a, a word of knowledge, it may be uncommon to them. They may be, like, surprised by it, but they're more intrigued than they are weirded out. It's just not, like, weird like that. And so Paul encourages people to do other things, like prophesy, for instance, and allows people to speak in tongues. So he encourages the church to do other stuff like prophesy and allows people to speak in tongues in the church. So it's downplayed for corporate use, but Paul says in verse 39, we should not forbid it, which means that there were some people in the church in Corinth who probably wanted to forbid it. And some of you guys need to hear this today. You may have had bad history with tongues. Uh, it just may be confusing to you. Maybe the, the mystery of it just is like, ah, there's fear around it. Maybe you don't understand it. But we don't form our theology based on bad experiences or bad examples, right? We form our theology based on scripture. And scripture says it's a gift from God. I don't know what to tell you. This isn't like a thing I do. I'm trying to convince you. This is, just, this is the Bible. What Paul is saying is, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, but do throw out the bathwater. Keep the baby, keep tongues, 
but throw out the bathwater. What's the bathwater? Lots of people doing it in public at the same time with no interpretation. He's not saying stop doing it. He's just saying do it better. So because the other gifts are more easily and obviously edifying to the body, tongues may happen from time to time in the public gathering, but it's going to be much less frequent than the other gifts. Now, if you are going to use it in a public church gathering, here's what you need to know. It has to be done with an interpretation. The gift of interpretation is exactly what it sounds like, the supernatural ability from God to interpret tongues. Sometimes the gift of interpretation is given to the person with the tongue. Sometimes it is given to someone else. In a public gathering, why must there be interpretation? Verse four, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one that speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. The gifts of the Spirit are always for the edification of believers. Tongues always builds up the person speaking, even if there's no interpretation, but it can only build up the ones hearing if there is an interpretation. Why? He gives us two examples as he goes on. The first one is a harp player. He's like, if somebody's playing the harp or any instrument just starts blasting out all these different notes and there's no distinguishable uh, melody, how do you know what song it is? Nobody's encouraged by that. Nobody's edified by that. His second example is the trumpeter in the military. Back then, 2,000 years ago, they had different trumpet calls that would communicate what was supposed to happen in the army or in the military. And he's like, if the trumpeter doesn't, isn't clear in his trumpet blast, nobody's going to know what to do. That's not edifying. Without an interpretation, there is no corporate edification. Okay, then, how does this work practically? I don't know how it works at other churches, but let's just say here's how it work, would work at like a reality prayer meeting or something like that. There's an appropriate time where it seems like somebody could uh, speak a tongue and they speak loud enough and obviously loud enough for everybody to hear. It's not just under their breath. They speak it. They want everybody to hear. The person who's leading the prayer meeting would say, hey, that was a tongue. Uh, the Bible says that we need to wait for an interpretation, so we're just going to wait a couple minutes. We would wait for an interpretation. If there was an interpretation, we'd acknowledge it. We'd say, hey, that was an interpretation. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. And you'd move on. Very simple. Very cool. Now, what if there's no interpretation? Verse 28 says, if there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and or herself and to God. So someone speaks in tongues. You wait for the interpretation. No interpretation comes. The person leading the meeting would say something like, hey, unfortunately, there's nobody to interpret tongues here tonight. And so for the rest of the night, let's just speak in known languages so that we can all be edified. Not a big deal. What might an interpretation look like? Unlike prophecy, again, it's not going to be to people or the church. It's going to be toward God. It's going to be prayer or praise or thanksgiving. Does there always need to be an interpretation? In the context of a public church gathering, if it is spoken at a volume that is obviously loud enough for everyone in the room or in the space to hear, then yes, there always needs to be an interpretation. Now, Dom, what about the guy who sits next to me? I hear him speaking in tongues a little bit louder than he probably should. Sorry. Move over a seat. You don't have to be the tongue police. You don't have to be like, hey, hey, this guy. There, is there an, he speak? I hear him. Is there an interpreter? You don't have to do it. He's, he's not trying or she is not trying to speak at a volume for everybody to hear, albeit maybe they should be speaking quieter, but they're not doing it in a public way. So there does not need to be an interpretation is what verse 28 says. Now, listen, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to be honest. The tongue police. That's funny. I'm going to be honest. I know lots of people who, who speak in tongues, but not very many who interpret. So if we really want to exercise the gift in public church gatherings, then verse 13 says that we should pray that we can interpret our own tongues so that we can guarantee that people can be edified. If we cannot interpret, 
and we do not know for sure that there is someone there who can interpret, then it's really best, as verse 28 to sa- says, to just speak privately to God and preferably at a volume that is not distracting to other people. It's that simple. And if it's going to happen in a public gathering, then it also needs to be with order. What does that mean? First of all, it means one in turn and only a few. Verse 27 says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak one at a time and someone must interpret. With order also means that you don't speak when it's not appropriate to speak. When would it not be appropriate? Well, he just said right there if somebody else is speaking, but also at a public gathering where there is no interpreter or at a gathering where it's just not a part of that church culture. A lot of churches are like that. Listen, nobody's blessed if you start blasting tongues in the middle of a, a church thing, like a prayer meeting or whatever, where, where the church doesn't speak in tongues and, or people aren't, they don't know about it. It's not part of their culture. Nobody's blessed by that. Nobody's encouraged by that. And honestly, it's not loving. And the Bible says that the gifts, all the gifts are for the edification of the body and are always to be done from a motivation and a goal of love. That is neither edifying or loving. Now, what if it is a private, not public, but a private gathering of only believers? So it's like six people, you're invited believers to your house, you know them all, it's invite only Paul actually permits it without an interpretation. Why? Because number one, unbelievers are not going to be present. And number two, it's not a public church gathering. The instruction Paul is giving here is specifically about public church gatherings. In Acts chapter 10, it was a private home with just Christians and there was no interpretation. In Acts chapter 19, it was a private group of Christians and there was no interpretation. But you still have to be sensitive to the environment that you're in. Just because it's like a private group of Christians who are maybe even mature, maybe even who understand 1 Corinthians 14, it doesn't mean that it's the culture of that gathering. You have to be sensitive to that. But assuming it is part of the culture, yeah, it's fine. Now, if it's going to be public, it's also best in small gatherings. You got to understand that Paul was writing to a group, a church, not like a big church like this. The church in Corinth was like 20 to 30 people. Small gathering, right? Everybody can hear each other. Honestly, in a big room, you literally can't hear each other when you're on the other side. So it's just not edifying in, in the same way. There's also a greater chance when it's a bigger gathering that there's gonna, there might be some believers who just are non-believers who sneak in to the meeting, which it won't be edifying for them or they're gonna be, feel alienated. For us at Reality also, we would just never do this at one of our main services. There's, there's the possibility of way too many non-believers present at the gathering. Um, we would prefer, like Paul, to pray and worship in a language that is understandable by the people without an interpretation. Like, if you go somewhere and you can speak in a language that everybody else understands, you choose to do that, right, as opposed to speaking through an interpreter. It's more efficient. It's just more edifying. Um, it's just, it's simpler. And so we're with, we're with Paul on that. But most notably, this is really important. Also, the Sunday gathering is not the place for every single gift to be operated. You just can't. We're not going to all operate in all of our gifts all the time. And it's not the only place that gifts are operated. And it's not the place that all the gifts need to be operated. And so you're only going to see like a few of the gifts operate. You're going to see like teaching and the gift of encouragement and the gift of prophecy and the gift of hospitality and the gift of service, but you're not going to see out loud tongues at a Sunday service. But in a small gathering of believers, especially mature believers who understand 1 Corinthians 14 or even one-on-one with a mature, a, a mature believer, yeah, for sure, go for it. Okay, wrapping it up here. So you're like, all right, dude, I'm down. I'm cool with this. I'm good. I get it. I see that it's a gift from God. I see, I had uh, a brother who I love. He's in his 80s, been a Christian for 60 years, came up to me last service, and he's like, you know, I haven't had this gift before, but man, I sure could see the benefit now, right? It's like, maybe you haven't had it for a long time. And you're like, dude, okay, I'm down. Like, I, I, I want this. How do you get it? Ask the father. Ask him. If you have asked and have not yet received, ask again. That's what Jesus told us to do. If you don't want it, that's okay. God's not gonna force it on you. 
But don't let past experience or people's misuse or fear or the mystery of it guide your thinking around the subject. At the same time, honestly, you guys, it's really not that big of a deal. But if you want it, ask. And then secondly and lastly, desire more of him. You know, we should be thankful for the gifts of the spirit. But the greatest gift of all is the spirit himself. He is the gift. His presence in us and with us is the gift. And so I encourage you to just desire more of him. And as you do, you will get all that he is and all that he has for you when he has it for you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. What a fascinating and cool thing, Lord, that you would provide this mysterious heavenly language and sometimes unknown earthly languages to praise you in for the edification of the body and in the case of the heavenly language, especially for the building up of ourselves and our relationship with you. What a tool, what a gift. And so I just say thank you, Lord, for this. And on behalf of the, the parts of the church who have just abused this, I, we just say sorry, Lord, that many people have treated this wrongly and made it something that it's not and made other people feel ostracized by it or less than if they don't have it and more than if they do have it. All that weird comparison stuff. We just say, sorry that that's happened in your church, Lord, and we don't want to be a part of that at Reality Ventura. We want to be a part of that. We just want to look at your word and be like, wow, this is so rad. What a beautiful thing. We want to receive everything that you have for us. We want to receive everything you have for us, Lord.